Yeah, I want to point to, I, I, I uh, pulled a paragraph, I think it was out of chapter three. Mm-hmm. Um, and you mentioned this earlier on as well, um, but you state, accordingly, anarcha Islam's relation to capitalist states resembles, quote, a clinic, end quote, that I and Oedipal subject attend mm-hmm. to become relatively de edipalized and to decolonize. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot to say there, uh, mm-hmm. speaking to, to you know, the Oedipal subject, and, and mm-hmm. uh, this relates to when you talk about uh, microfascism, how fascism is, yes, there's the macro politics of fascism, which we, you know, we think of fascism, we think of uh, Mussolini, we think of Hitler, we think of the Nazis, we think of MAGA, we think of Trump, we think of some mm-hmm. of these, you know, movements of people right. and, and ideas and so on, you know, the aesthetics of fascism. But that cannot really occur without the sort of microfascism, the fascisms within us, the fascists that exist in our own psyches, mm-hmm. right? Right. Um, I really appreciated that in you talking about the sort of anti-authoritarian um, tendencies or, or principles within Islam as a way to counter that. Of course, um, I think contemporary radical leftists could learn something about this, these ethics of how to mm-hmm. deal with disagreements, how to mm-hmm. build community, how to work with people they don't agree with mm-hmm. and on every point ideologically, but nonetheless you have a common goal. Um, yeah, I guess I guess if you could speak to I mean, this is personal for you, but uh, nonetheless, talking about this clinic, this place that you come to within yourself, within your work, uh, of what is anarcha Islam uh, and how this applies to, um, yeah, I think how, you know, people who don't have to become Muslim, they don't have to necessarily be extremely well versed in its ideas and its practices and so on, but still can learn a great deal from that in the ways in which they can engage with activism, decolonization, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist work, whatever it may be. So as 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 you noted, you know, there is a distinction. And again, this, this is the issue with, and this is the crisis of language that we're facing, you know, Trump fascist to this, this fascist to that. Mm-hmm. As I noted, fascism is a math psychology. Who amongst us is not an authoritarian or has patriarchal tendencies or authoritarian tendencies, has a mini Obama, a mini Mubarak, a mini Trump that is ready and willing to unleash mm-hmm. themselves upon the community. We know that patriarchy exists within anarchist communities. We know that sexism, we know that racism exists within anarchist communities. So let's not play this puritanical politics. We've all, as you noted, and as I write, and has a, and this is the difference, right? Is Hannah Arendt, or, or sorry, Hannah Arendt wrote, sorry, The Origins of Totalitarianism, and, and it was William Reich, a Nazi, who wrote The Mass Psychology of Fascism. And mm. This is, you know, the, the, the understand in the same way that we, we talked about how liberals engage in covert kinds of racism, um, vis-a-vis the multicultural paradigms of reference that they refer to. I have my black friend, I have my Muslim friend, I have my queer friend, mm-hmm. therefore I'm not racist. That I find to be far more insidious and dangerous than the Trump, MAGA, everything. Mm-hmm. Um, simply because I, I would re- rather be called uh, a whatever, a San Negro, as uh, I was referred to, and as Arabs were referred to, to my face, then dealing with somebody who would deny um, prejudice that exist within them and the monsters that exist within them, let alone, like I said, the stereotypes that we've all internalized of one another. So coming clean with regards to that and having that internal fight every single day, as we know, patriarchy is the responsibility of men to deal with uh, listening as opposed to just hearing women being okay with uh, discussing their emotions, their feelings, as opposed to embellishing their uber machismo character. Mm-hmm. So totalitarianism offer. So fascism is uh, is very cancerous that way. It is what we must fight. Totalitarianism is something different. It operates vis-a-vis repressive, suppressive mechanisms from the top down. Trump wanted to become a totalitarian, like um, like Stalin, <laughs> like Lenin, <laughs> like very much, uh, you know. Um, the cases in China or in North Korea or, or with Putin and so on and so forth. It, th- that appeal of total outright control certainly exists. Mm-hmm. But then we need to, in in order to, to battle, we have to know what our enemy exactly is, including the enemy that exists within us. And one thing that 
again, contributes to our humility is identifying that enemy within us. And hence, this is the reason in Islam, we have the greater jihad, jihad al-akbar or jihad al-nafs, which means to struggle against one's inner privileges and fascisms within themselves on a daily, on a routine, on a habitual basis within itself. What can facilitate that, of course, overcoming is certainly an individual responsibility. It's a communal responsibility insofar as how we call one another out within our communities as well, because we also know that there's vicious kinds of calling out mechanisms that actually act to our detriment. They feed into shame, insecurities, and we all have these fears and insecurities because we're longing for community at the same time. But because we don't have community, our egos get the better of us by wanting to hoard and confiscate space, authority, despite being anti-authoritarian or trying to embody an anti-authoritarian ethic at the same time. So we at best hear one another when I enter into an anarchist space as a Muslim anarchist or a Jewish anarchist or whoever anarchist goes into the space and we are responsible for proving the reconciliation of our identities within itself whereby a white anarchist does not have to do so. Mm. It's not, it is not incumbent. And that's no different than, of course, everybody vying to become a hyphenated American, Canadian, whatever, the Native American, the African American, the Muslim American, and so on. But the white American gets away with simply calling themselves an American because that's supposed to be the nativism that exists within um, this colonial identity. What anarchists can certainly learn and what can really everybody can learn but what could help facilitate um, this mitigating of stereotypes, of disagreements that happen because of ego, because of lack of knowledge, lots of reasons, are what I refer to as and also the diafa, the ethics of disagreement or the ethics of conflict resolution um, and the ethics of hospitality. Um, and I keyed into this very early on, not because of only my involvement within anarchist communities, but I recall spending time with Philippe de Saint. He was the Archbishop Diocese of uh, the San Andreas Peace Accords uh, between the Zapatistas and the Mexican state in 1994, after the Zapatistas had declared war on the Mexican state. And I remember he became very disillusioned with uh, the church itself in Mexico, despite the fact that it's far more, let me use this word, loosely, I was going to say progressive, but radical in terms of its liberation theology, mm. um, than certainly other churches within Euro-America, um, at least certainly within the recent contemporary. Um, and he became disillusioned and began to be involved within Zapatista and non-Zapatista communities, including which are Muslim Zapatistas, as a matter of fact, insofar as conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. and developing this organization that focuses on conflict resolution to delineate, like I said, uh, the differences uh, and particularly the misconceptions that we have of one another. And there are certainly plenty. Mm -hmm. So it is an act of humility. And Islam does have an ethics of disagreement, whether it's abided by or not. That's a whole together different element of discussion. But it also involves an element of hospitality, because in order to have a disagreement that goes beyond, you know, what's your name, uh, what do you do, how do you identify? No, we need to create an environment, a room, um, a context, a situation in which we're able to sit down and actually get to know one another, get to know the palabras, the mother tongues that each of us are speaking, the words that we're using, how we're expressing and using the words that we're using within itself to identify, okay, to what extent is there resonance in our commitments or not? Uh, and it's a difficult challenge. It's not only between Muslims and anarchists, it's anarchists amongst themselves. For instance, you know, when you meet an anarchist that may be an anti-capitalist and anti-authoritarian and anti-statist, but maybe queerophobic mm -hmm. or whatever else, right? So to what extent does one offer solidarity? And these are very difficult questions. To what extent, as Darida would say, would you open your house, and of course you wouldn't, to a rapist or a misogynist or somebody who's patriarchal, right? Uh, but there needs to be some kind of room equally to allow for these discussions to be had. Um, and part of that is hospitality, feeding one another, cooking with one another, spending time with one another, living with one another. Um, um, and that becomes a part of the dynamic and a part of the conversation that hopefully will lead to uh, more fruitful uh, avenues, discussions, as opposed to us tearing each other apart. Because in so many ways, that the left has mastered that. Uh, though folks on the right, and I use the right and the left again rather loosely, because politics operates around a continuum. It, it isn't. It isn't simply you know polarities of the right and the left at the same time. Um, but the right is brilliant at keeping it together. 
Um, mm-hmm. uh, whereas the left loves to tear each other apart along so-called ideological differences. And this is the problem, is that the left is extremely ideological, although ideologies don't really exist. Marx doesn't have an answer just as much as Islam doesn't have an answer, just as much as anarchism doesn't have an answer to all the problems of the world. Um, the Zapatistas have a saying, you know, nobody can plan revolutions, but holding each other's hands, we ask what each of us knows. And we teach one another that way. And then we plan for this uprising and we prepare for it together that way in unison and by matching our rhythm. Um, but yeah, the ability to overcome that you your penis, the colonial coloniality, that modernity that, uh, like I said, has, has uh, been mimicked, has uh, been reflected upon all our traditions. That is something that becomes absolutely crucial. Instead of European, you're American. And again, I love Christianity. Islam is a continuation of it. I know a lot of Eastern Christians and I dabble with a lot of Eastern Christian interpretations. So, you know, why reject a beautiful faith and a beautiful tradition? I mean, if you reject it, you reject it. But at the same time, why? walk away from it, why not decolonize it? And I know many who are and are keen on that, whether they exist within Euro-America or whether they are Euro-American or not. Um, but that becomes the challenge. You can't just throw away uh, the baby with the bathwater, religion. And again, there's a distinction between religion and faith and spirituality. These are interrelated concepts. They certainly, but they're also different as they exist in Islam, um, or at least as, under, as they are understood within Islam. So. The ability to interrogate, to face these realities, um, to face oneself really in the mirror, and to be able to see the monsters uh, for what it is that they are. I mean, it's part of the same echoed uh, revolutionary impulse, reactionary impulse, nonetheless, that exists in which a whole bunch of anarchists will go join the Kurds in their struggle in the context of Syria, a context of which they know very, very little historically, mm-hmm. racially, ethnically about yet they're not willing to do the same on the front lines as far as indigenous struggles on the very land that they reap the benefits of and the privileges of. Why don't you deal with the monster of imperialism that is right there, of settler colonialism that is right there? Oh, but it becomes easier to just hop on a plane and go travel in some adventurous escapade elsewhere to free these brown mm-hmm. people that don't look like us um, mm-hmm. and to romanticize their struggle. That's the Orientalist, again, modern colonial trope that is being reproduced. Uh, in addition to, like I said, the anti-spiritual. Sure, there exists a lot of people within predominantly Muslim communities, and there's a reason for that, particularly within uh, you know, probably non-Euro-American societies that have shunned away Islam or are Islamophobic, but there are reasons for that. Um, and we could sit down and talk about that, but, you know, and the secularist aspirations by some on the left there uh, and so on and so forth. But that's also a very different matter um, yeah. altogether. So, 